Hey everyone, Sam from Crash Course Hammer here. Uh, just thought I'd make a quick response video to um, Staccata's, or I should say uh, more specifically Paul's recent video that he just posted uh, about the wrong buckler. Uh, and this is of course in uh, relation to what sort of buckler was used in English sword and buckler systems. Now, uh, as you know, I've uh, put up two videos a little while ago regarding some of the thoughts I had uh, on it. And I thought I would just do a quick little reply. It's such a shame we don't have a direct reply function anymore, but if you're watching this, Paul, hopefully uh, hopefully I'm on the right track. Um, just a quick uh, response to Paul's video. So let me first start by saying that I am pretty much in agreement uh, with Paul on quite a few of the points. Uh, firstly, the size of the buckler, which I can definitely independently verify. Whilst I was uh, making those first two videos, um, I very, very, very much uh, found that the way that you generally use them, that is to say if you're using a basket hilt with a buckler, really does need a bigger buckler. Um, and Paul, of course, cited way more sources that I was not familiar with, so he's definitely got that. Um, and I based my thoughts on the size of the buckler based primarily on the surviving examples of Welsh bucklers that we have uh, available to us, which I'll be popping up uh, throughout the course of this video. Um, and if I can upload the, um, the uh, essay uh, on Welsh bucklers that I that I managed to acquire. I'll also put that in a link somewhere below. I'd also like to mention uh, that whilst this is not good academic uh, rigueur, but I'm not a very good academic, um, to further back up Paul's point of just the sheer size, besides the surviving examples we have, and uh, also on top of, of course, the primary sources that Paul provided, we also have um, pictures, I know, right? We also have uh, paintings and images of, yes, various sizes of buckler, but one particularly um, famous example that's frequently cited uh, that has a English buckler, sorry, a Welsh buckler, which is the style, of course, um, but very curiously, it is slung over the back of the individual carrying it. Now, it might be the gentleman's personal one that he's carrying, probably actually belongs to uh, another gentleman and this is just a retainer, someone carrying it on his behalf. But people often like to point out that, ah, that's clearly a targe or an early form of targe slung over the back, which of course, as you know, is a Scottish shield. But you can, it, it's, yes, I could see why you would say that on first glance, but upon closer inspection, and comparing it to what we know, it is clearly a Welsh buckler, and I'll put an image of it in here. It is clearly a Welsh buckler slung over the back, which just reinforces really Paul's point that these things, and also the primary sources, that these things were bigger. On average, they were bigger than what you might find on the continent. Now, just to quickly uh, touch on as a matter of clarification, um, there are generally accepted to be three types or three distinct stages of Welsh uh, buckler or English buckler. Um, the example that Paul pointed out that apparently is meant to be purported to be in the Royal Armouries, but uh, they told him that it wasn't because I have also seen images of it that say it is in the Royal Armouries and I have seen pictures of it in a display case in the Royal Armouries. I've never actually seen it in person though. Um, but apparently they don't have it. All right, fair enough. But that is an example of what is known as a Type 1. Again, refer to the essay uh, that I've linked below from uh, the Antiques Journal. Um, so what that is, is that is the very early type. So that's a Type 1. Then, of course, there is the Type 2, uh, which is sort of the middle of the road and tends to be the most... Uh, well, the most sort of fancy one, let's just say. It's the one that's often referred to in Welsh 
uh, supposedly may be referred to in Welsh uh, sort of sagas and stories and things like that, because they frequently talk about having shiny steel or what would be tinned steel with glowing golden rivets and it looks like the sun you know because it has these spokes and things like that that come out of it like a sun and it's meant to be red because the leather is red on the back so you've got this really colorful quite beautiful looking thing but we've got bugger all surviving examples of them uh, again i'll just keep popping up some pictures of uh, various examples that have these golden or rather brass uh, spokes and pins and things like that. Then of course there is the Type 3. This is the one that most people are more familiar with it would seem and it was also, as far as I could tell, the most prolific of the two or the one that hung around the longest. Um, it's important to note that these all sort of existed in a broadly similar period. It was obviously just a matter of personal preference. But the Type 3 um, is essentially what we might call the sort of final iteration. It doesn't have all the spokes. It might have alternating bands of tinned steel or tinned iron with brass uh, or gilded. Um, they all, almost always, have a brass or gilded rivets. Full stop. That's it. Very few of them to none of them have, um, have iron. Oh, well, they have an iron shank with a brass head. And it's a nail, sorry, not a rivet, and they are peened over at the back. Sorry, they're not peened over at all. Oh my god, they're folded over. Um, and you can have a look at that picture subsequently as an example. It's also interesting to note that the grips on the back are almost always exclusively wood and shaped like a, quote, yoke. Or in one case, I saw someone mention it that it looks like the top of a butter churn lid essentially. So they probably just got these grips from lid makers um, <laughs> and just whacked them up the back of them. So that's just a quick uh, FYI regarding how there are three types. The point, the one that Paul pointed out, the picture, was a type 1. However, the replica that he created uh, doesn't exist as a Welsh buckler, but does exist in sort of more continental mono steel, the whole thing's still made of one part. Welsh bucklers are almost always made, well they are, they are always made of three materials, wood, leather and metal. Now regarding the interference of the basket or a fully developed basket with uh, the buckler or the rim of the buckler or the side of the buckler, um, again I don't disagree with Paul, I'm not disagreeing with Paul here, it absolutely does interfere and if you uh, watch the videos that I produced you'll note that I very very much stress the fact that someone like McBain specifically says to keep your weapon more or less in front of your buckler so as that it does not interfere. Um, of course McBain's buckler was entirely different um, to Silver's buckler and also McBain's weapon would have been different to Silver's weapon as well but Broadly speaking, they're sort of in the same family. Complex hilted, cut centric weapons with a larger than average uh, disc basically held in front of you in a similar manner to a dagger. However, if we look at some surviving examples of what we might call uh, English or Irish hilts that existed at the same time, so uh, at the same time as Welsh bucklers were popular, um, or most commonly seen to be kicking around, so that is to say late Tudor Elizabethan, as Paul points out. I'll just pop up some quick examples of the Mary Rose hilt, um, and a sort of basket hilts that are similar to it. As you can see, they're actually not all covering. You'll notice that the outside uh, part of the guard. So they have the crossbar, obviously, but you can see it's starting to sort of curl around and it's becoming residual. This, of course, would later turn into what we now, uh, in Scotland, what would become the big nose hilt or the ribbon hilt, or, or the, yeah, big nosed ribbon hilt, um, because they just chop them off, basically. They figured they were useless. Um, <laughs> and they were, they were more cumbersome than they were worth. Um, but here we have this interesting transition where we have a half basket. So we have the classic 
quote, English style basket hilt. So that's that X sort of frame with quite wide spacing, you know, and various little iterations. But it looks like a basket hilt, but it's clearly a distinct variant in period. Apparently it was called an Irish hilt. You know, um, we're not going to, um, I'm sure Paul will have something to say on that more accurately. Um, but if you look at them, you can see that the inside part of the guard is just like later sabres or a, or a dusak of a similar period or, a, or what have you, various sword types. There is less protection on the inside. That is to say, the side that would sit against your hip when it was in its scabbard, when it was sheathed, and on the side that is less likely to get hit, generally speaking, which is your inside line. So if you hold it in your right hand, it's to the left of your hand where your knuckles are. I think this is just a, a quick little interesting point because I don't own one, but I could definitely foresee that interfering, still interfering with your, um, with your basket hilt, absolutely, but I suspect it would interfere this particular style, so this demi-basket, uh, if you want to call it that, a half basket or two-third basket or three-quarter basket, I suspect that that would interfere slightly less than a fully developed basket. Of course, again, Paul was only just using one in the video because it's what he had at hand. I'm not sure, but that was probably the case. You know, we, we, we don't all have infinite money, sadly. No one has that, so we can't just phew, buy an example of this and say, oh, I did one video on it. And We're not all I post swords, you know, who can just pop over to... Poland and purchase bundles of swords. And if you haven't checked out I Post Swords channel, I highly recommend you do. Um, <laughs> um, so, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, the demi basket, I suspect, would interfere significantly less, or maybe not significantly, but would interfere less with a, uh, the rim of one's buckler. But I will point out exact, and this just comes back to what Paul said. 100% agree that they, the edge of the buckler must be forward facing because when I have, stupidly, used a late period saber with the buckler that you saw in my video, so that small buckler piccolo, the small one, all right, small metal buckler, I had the misfortune to basically go to do a nice little bolognese little clip, you know, hit the side of the buckler, overextended my arm and ended up whacking my fingers full bore into the edge of a buckler as I was trying to push that in the opposite direction to increase obviously the get or decrease the gaps and really make it tight. That really, really hurt. Um, so if I had a forward facing buckler, I'm going to keep calling it forward facing because I don't know whether it's convex or concave, I can't remember. Um, I'm not a geometrist. Geometrist? Oh my god. A forward facing buckler the chance of me whacking my fingers in that case would be significantly reduced. And if we look at the hilts, they also have a similar issue. Even though they've got the classic single bar there just to protect the front of your fingers, you probably might still, if you were incredibly clumsy, somehow get you know your fingers chopped. Um, however, I just want to bring that point up simply because the angle it would appear and this is just me thinking on the fly here you know i'm walking around the room in my pajamas for example doing this <laughs> the the angle of the forward or the forward part of the angle so the angle at which it goes to or is the depth um would be significantly reduced so you could have essentially a flatter buckler if you have a complex or a less complex hilt so you need a steeper angle, the more comprehensive your hand protection, because there is more stuff going on, so you need to have um, essentially more of a gap. And we have, if you check out um, the book, the fantastic book called The Book of the Buckler, which up until recently I owned a version of, but is now currently out of print, um, because, you know, when you need money and you need to pay bills, you have to get rid of it, and I never got around for, to doing a... Uh, review of it, sadly. Probably should have done that. Um, but in that book, you can really see the sort of proportions and specs of these things. And we can see that there are examples that have a really steep angle of the sort of funnel. 
that exist on the continent as well. So, in summary, I know it's been a bit rambly, but again, this is pretty off the cuff. So, in summary, um, how would you use the the specific buckler that, as Paul pointed out, that is larger than average, is more cone-shaped or funnel-shaped, a forward-sweeping curve or funnel shaped buckler, okay, that tends to be significantly larger, so large in fact that you sometimes might have to carry it strapped to your back, all right, with a weapon that has at least, okay, at least two-thirds, you know, three-quarter sort of complex hilt, all right, and ultimately a completely fully encompassing basket hilt in a manner, all right, that is specifically related to the dagger, that is to say that the same, they're all used as one. Which system would I base it on if I only had that information? Straight away, the targa. And the purpose of that is that it doesn't move. It doesn't move. It is nowhere near, and the sources keep saying this over and over again. Manchelino, Morozzo, uh, good old Degrassi, of course, he's a classic. The targa is not moved. The buckler, doesn't matter whether it's, you know, the piccolo or brocchero or the big one, you know, uh, that is generally very mobile, as Paul points out, as anyone who has done any sort of buckler system tends to find. There's a certain level of mobility with a smaller one that you need and you use and you get, and it works as a system. With the targa, it is totally different. So thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, Again, a little bit rambly, but that's just because I was so excited to get at least something out uh, the same day as Paul published his uh, video. Um, I would strongly recommend subscribing to Staccato. They've got all kinds of good stuff. Um, I will put the link to the video in question, which is titled The Wrong Buckler, uh, in the description below, because we can't do video responses, which is annoying. Um, and other than that, get yourself an enormous buckler, get yourself a basket hilt, get thyself a manual that deals with both a dagger and targa, and you can put together a reasonable semblance of the system. Basically, you're going to be punching them with two knuckle dusters the whole time. Thanks for listening, and until next time, I'll see you guys later.